we are going to be talking on concepts of abdominal wall reconstruction. Naturally, first of all, we always question ourselves, what is the problem that we are trying to solve? We see hernias very commonly as surgeons, general surgeons, and we have a solution for it. Therefore, if somebody comes up and says that, okay, we need newer solutions, definitely there was a problem in the older solution whereby people are offering newer solution. So we'll take a look at what the problem is, then we'll try to see what the older solution was, what was the problem, and what does the newer solution offer to us as something more than the older solution. So this is how we'll take it. Where either it is a primary or incisional, typically a periumbilical hernia, right? This is one of the commonest presentation we see. And it is not difficult to offer any of the choices that we have in our armamentarium. You could do open suture repair, you could do open only mesh repair, you could do open retromuscular repair, you could do laparoscopic intraperitoneal only mesh repair, you could do IPOM plus. So you could offer any of these procedures to the patient and the patient would do well and therefore if you ask their cohort of surgeons, are you happy with the way you are offering the treatment? Everybody will say yes. Because this disease complex, this setting is simple enough for cure by any of the options that I have mentioned. But let us take a look at this patient who has got a 15 centimeter wide incisional hernia, rectus have splayed laterally. Because of the patient being very young, the muscle tone is high and therefore in this patient, if we were to treat the hernia, an only mesh would be only a bridging repair because these edges are not going to come without tension. Even if you did an eye pump, laparoscopic ventral hernia repair, again you would not be able to have any inferior uh, area where to uh, have a good overlap of the mesh from the defect. So in this patient, the concerns would be to give a better scar, a poser defect and to put in a mesh in the place where it would lead to least recurrence and least surgical site occurrences or SSOs. So these are going to be your targets in this patient. This is a neglected patient with ventral hernia, incisional hernia where it has become incarcerated, is probably getting ischemic. The skin condition is bad, very close to the uh, pubic bone, so it is a supra pubic hernia. And because there is truncal obesity, it makes for poor patient factor, poor hernia factors and poor wound factors. So as I said, the way we look at hernia is now not only according to EHS classification, but also according to how Dr. Nowitzki look, looks at it hernia factors, patient factors and wound factors and all of that are bad in this patient. So you would like to give something really radical to this patient. This patient is a typical example of how when you examine somebody in the supine position, you would think, okay, it's a doable hernia, it's a bad skin but doable hernia till you ask the patient to cuff and or elevate the head. The half of the abdomen is inside this visceral sac. So this patient has got a 25 centimeter wide defect hernia in the lower abdomen. This patient has got very poor abdominal muscle tone. So this patient should typically need something which would be very similar to what you would need for groin hernia. You need a GPRVS for groin hernia. You would need something very similar GPRVS for this kind of ventral hernia. You would like to reinforce the entire abdominal wall. Similar to what we did now. We did not look at the defect side. We know it is recurrent, recur, recur twice after surgery. We should do something very radical. This is a flank hernia, right? So a flank hernia is, has got certain challenges. Look at that, okay? 
there are plenty of challenges in these kind of hernia these atypically sighted hernias one challenge is that this could be a case of denervation typically in a flank hernia it could be a case of denervation where surgery will not be of great help you have to understand that it has gone beyond surgical salvage but if it is a mechanical defect the nerves are okay then this patient the other challenges would be where do you place the mesh how do you fix it because it is so close to the rib cage posteriorly the psoas and the vessels are there in fear the iliac bone is there with all its major vessels where do you fix it in these three quadrants only the one part is of the entry abdominal wall is conducive to reasonable fixation what about the three other sides so this patient again would benefit with a more radical approach where if possible you could give a repair where you don't have to fix the mesh that much rather you have a generous overlap of the mesh preferably in the retromuscular plane then your intra abdominal pressure becomes your own friend and keeps the mesh in place and this likely that this patient will have least recurrence and less surgical site occurrences so this is one of those cases where the thought process again tells you that you can use principles of when you do a ct scan and if you see a diffuse bulge no defect uh, uh, on anatomy then you know it is a neuromotor problem now this is a patient who had a bariatric surgery had a leak laparotomy to salvage the leak then developed gallstones had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy did not work out the way had a subcostal cholecystectomy by open approach developed a irreducible paraumbilical hernia an epigastric hernia and two drain site hernias so when you get these patients if you look at the patient factors so obesity is one of those patient factors which is instrumental to recurrence for every one bmi increase is a tremendous increase in intra abdominal pressure and that has been measured by freeze et al and they have seen that the more the obstruction obesity more the chances of failure so saying that okay my repair is so good my mesh is so good my fixation is so good that it can withstand any obese patient is not correct there is a time when you there will be a failure of your technique because of truncal obesity so first thing in this patient would be to tackle her obesity without a weight loss patient is destined to fail again and secondly if you look at the hernia factors in this patient the patient does not have one hernia the plenty of hernias scattered in the abdomen some of them are symptomatic so you can't leave them alone third you've got a subcostal incision whereby you can understand there is no zone uh, three vessels coming from the intercostal so you have lost all your intercostal nerves and vessel supply right on the right side because of the midline incision you don't expect much but looking at the anatomy you are very wary of the fact that this is going to be an ischemic zone if you went anything through a midline incision chances of ischemic necrosis at the margins are going to be very high if you do lipocutaneous flaps again very high so probably doing something after weight reduction the right choice would be to again think about rest retromuscular the entire abdomen mesh so maybe that would be a good answer to give for this patient but of course this is open to question you could say argue why not an open only uh, and i said i would be very hesitant because mm. of the ischemia and the fact that the patient is obese there would be too much of sso look at this abdomen and although the defect is small look at the redundancy of the skin i mean this it would be criminal not to address the skin condition in this patient so this is another example of how we should be looking at various wound factors which is going to be instrumental in making us decide what to do as i said truncal obesity this patient is actually not too huge she is about 67 68 kilos truncal obesity look at the divarication that truncal obesity causes if you look at this kind of truncal obesity with so much of divarication repairing the umbilical hernia 
right so this is truncal obesity with divarication i know when we discuss in the groups whatsapp facebook even in conferences we keep on saying divarication is a cosmetic problem basically the surgeon it is a difficult thing for a surgeon to ignore the patient has been ignoring it for years and most of us as surgeons we also have not been treating divarication but there is one setting where i believe that we should treat divarication and that is typically the patient comes to you with a parambilical hernia truncal obesity and we don't check for divarication and we do a repair by ipom or open only recurrence of the the recurrence rate in these patients Very are high because the divarication is a weak point is an indicator that the entire midline is weak i have had patients who came with epigastric hernias or the hernia at the site of my divarication because the mesh where i fixed the mesh there was still a weakness so i have become more hesitant in treating this setting of parambilical hernia with divarication small parambilical an easy job but with a divarication and truncal obesity i would not uh, tackle the hernia defect alone i would probably be a little more radical in my approach not to have a recurrence this is another example see as i was saying parambilical hernia i can easily go there this is a cavg patient i would love to go in put in a ipom and just come out 45 minutes job but with that divarication i would get a little scared with that at the top the drain site and the incision coming from the cabg down below is very potential site for uh, for hernias and even if the patient doesn't present with hernia now they may present later so might as well reinforce the entire midline i would say in this patient so i'm just telling you my thought process it doesn't actually mean this is what you should do i'm just explaining to you how we think differently now right so this picture is to demonstrate what do you think is the size of the hernia defect in this patient <coughs> approx 20 by 18 right so you would typically expect there's a 20 cm long and maybe 15 cm wide hernia this patient will be having we do a ct scan in this patient we find the hernia defect is 2 by 2 cm how much 2 by 2 cm only yeah the sac is big the sac is big <laughs> so when you see epigastric hernias that's how it is they are typically small defect hernias epigastric hernias but the they will look very voluminous and in that patient the consideration is to take out all the sac to prevent a large seroma but you could close the defect by any of the methods suture mesh whatever because the defect size is 2 by 2 cm it just appears uh, so nasty so my point is do a ct scan more often when you see atypical hernia a classical parambilical hernia no divarication young patient no problem but if you see an incisional hernia if you see divarication large volume hernias do a ct scan although it will appear i am sure in medical college if i had said i would do a ct scan for hernia <laughs> people would have thought this probably got ulterior motives so uh, while we stay on this topic of ultrasonography number 1 the sonography machine which is available for doing intra abdominal they have to change the frequency first to see the entry abdominal wall that's one two is that more the obesity less the chances of detecting any hernia correct so if you have an obesity where there is more subcutaneous adiposity less of visceral chances are you will miss the hernia the sonologist will miss the hernia third is we don't use sonography anymore for hernia it's a ct scan if there's any doubt tomorrow we do one patient where clinically i thought there is no hernia but the patient has pain there's a lump could be lipoma could be neurofibroma it turned out to be an irreducible hernia with omentum inside getting ischemic so ct scan saved us but ultrasound would be do because we don't want to miss a uterine fibroid a gallstone these things we don't want to miss because it has been our experience that we have done the patient has come for hernia we have done the hernia and we have gone back to see about 3 months later there was a gallstone or maybe 2 months later they have come with acute cholecystitis now the patient is also very worried about if you're going to go through the mesh will it infect now the answer is not a clear cut no the answer is a maybe not but then the patients are not very happy with that answer at that time 
if you had detected it at the time of the primary hernia surgery, it would have saved us the embarrassment. And I think there is some science to prove that yes, if you are prepared to do these two surgeries together or plan it out, it will, it will lead to better results. Conventional treatment for these settings that I showed you would definitely not be a great idea. This is what I am saying. If we were to think that all these hernias I showed, the large defect hernias, contaminated wound, recurrences, atypically sighted hernias, if we were to dissect that area, put a mesh on it and suture it at the periphery, the only mesh concept, the problem would be that in this large defects, we will not be restoring function of the abdominal wall, one, and two, the chances of the intra-abdominal pressure pushing it out over a period of time is pretty high. Where we fix the mesh according to convention, I have been saying this right in the morning, 3 centimeter overlap, 5 centimeters, 8 centimeters. Now who knows? This overlap is based on the concept that maybe 5 centimeter beyond the hernia defects, the tissues are healthy, the tissues are strong. But that is so variable from patient to patient. Today I showed you one patient who has failed repair twice. There has been a fair overlap according to convention. There have been a good usage of mesh, that's a polypropylene hard mesh. Why does it fail? Because the overlap is probably the area of concern. We are thinking of overlap of 3, 5 centimeters. But maybe in some patients, the entire abdomen is so weak that we need to enforce the entire abdomen. So maybe I am sounding like overkilling the subject. But in these patients, where recurrence rate is as high as 30, 40 percent, we need to bring it down to an acceptable level. We will have to use a more radical approach. This we have been doing in groin hernia in the form of GPRVS. Why can't we do the same thing in ventral hernia? Just because we were not able to access the space. But what if you had access to that space and you could do the same surgery for ventral hernia? Won't you do the same, you won't you apply the same principle for ventral hernia that you apply for groin hernia? So think about it. So in a conventional treatment, whether you're putting in the mesh from the peritoneal cavity or from the subcutaneous level, you are basically trying to bridge the repair in the sense you're not closing the defect, you're trying to put in the mesh and fix it to the periphery. In the US, they used to do inlay mesh, which means they used to fix the mesh at the margin of the defect, which is now totally given up because of huge recurrence rate. But on a non-lay or IPOM, you fix the mesh 5 centimeters beyond the defect, right? Approximately. Now, the bridging repair has obviously not given good results in these complex hernias that I showed you. It has not given good results. If you look at the literature, you find really poor results of laparoscopic uh, eye, laparoscopic ventral hernia repair or an only mesh hernioplasty. For these giant defects, the results have been not been too good. What were the problems? Of course, the recurrence rate was a problem. Seromas, you see, it's still possible to do this epigastric hernia I told you with IPOM. You could bring down the falciform, look at the defect, bring all the momentum down, suture, close the defect, put in a mesh and come out. But the large sac will have a large seroma. So be prepared to face embarrassing questions. That's still something that you would want to address if you could. Mesh extrusion and rupture, it is not as uncommon as we think. If the large, hern large defect and you have put in a mesh as an onlay or an underlay, the entire mesh can be pushed outside into the, uh, into the defect and you would be surprised to see a CT scan a year or two later that the mesh is not even there at the place that you left it. That is because of the increased intra-abdominal pressure not allowing the mesh to stay at the place that you thought it would stay. And lastly, poor function and we will come to that. Why is there, uh, if you look at smaller defects and if you just bridge it, maybe it won't have any big problem. But if you close a large defect with bridging repair, the function of the abdominal muscle wall goes down and we'll come to that concept now. What is reconstruction? I probably asked this question in one of the forums earlier also. What does abdominal wall reconstruction mean to you? We have been using this term so often, but just because the Americans have been using it for the last 10 years, 
Why have we started using this term for the last two years? Why not call hernia repair? We are just talking about repair of complex ventral hernia. Let's talk about hernioplasties. Why do we even have to take a name such as abdominal wall reconstruction? So the reconstruction is different from the hernia repair in the sense that reconstruction would mean closing the defect in a tension free manner with autologous tissue. Whereas conventional treatment would be bridging the repair by a mesh or a prosthesis. So the difference lies, number one is that we are closing the defect with autologous tissue, tension free manner. We are reinforcing it with a prosthesis, yes. And we are trying to put in the mesh in the best plane possible where incorporation with the tissue will be on by both sides. If you look at bridging repair, whether it is on lay or it is under lay, the penetration is only from one side. It is not incorporated in the body. So, defect closure. How does defect closure help us? Why are we even thinking of defect closure? Now, I will talk about a concept of the broken cylinder. What is a cylinder? A cylinder is uh, something that we have seen like a barrel. It, has, it is closed from all sides, from the top, from the bottom and all sides by a, a curvy, uh, curvaceous uh, wall. Now, the abdomen is a cylinder. There's diaphragm at the top, there's pelvic diaphragm at the bottom, there's spine at the back, there's linea alba at the front, and there are three layers of muscles going in from the back to the front, enclosing a flat muscle, and then joining as a linea alba. There is no break in this cylinder. And why is there no break in the cylinder? There could have been, uh, nature could have provided us with a break there. The reason why there is no break in the cylinder is because we need this intact cylinder to perform core muscle function. And what are those core muscle functions? Number one, breathing. It's a core muscle function. <sighs> core muscle function. If it is, there's a defect of this size here, there will be paradoxical respiration. Cuffing. <coughs> core muscle function. Sneezing. <coughs> core muscle function. Urination. Well, I can't show you that. Urination. <laughs> so that is a core muscle function. Because you need to squeeze your abdominal muscle to produce pressure on the broader volume. Remember that trusser is just a small muscle. That is not what produces urination in all patients. Paralyzed patients can actually control the urination, right? How? Core muscles. Defecation. Core muscle function. So every function that you know on a day-to-day -day basis, physiological function is dependent on your core muscle function. Therefore, if there's a broken cylinder, these functions can get hampered. Number two, Look at some physical activity. If you are a deadlifter, or if you are a batsman, or a footballer, or a lawn tennis, or a badminton player, what do you use when you do a smash? You use your abdomen muscles to get tighter. Then you perform all functions. So all sportsmen, athletes will require good core muscle function. So when we talk about the abdomen and its function, the first thing is, let's look at the abdomen as a watertight cylinder and a break in the cylinder will lead to some loss of function. Typically a surgeon feels that the function of the abdominal wall is to keep all the viscera inside the abdomen and that's how we think. Which is why when we design operations, we design with a plug technique or a bridging repair so that the viscera should not come out. We reduce the contents, we make a plug. We forget that the function of the abdominal wall is more than this. There is abdominal movements, there is uh, physiological stuff like all the functions that I mentioned and the physical activity. Then one more function of the co of the abdomen is spinal stability. Now how many of you have seen massive hernia patients and if you have asked them about back pain, almost all will say, Pichha kub bata hai. Amra monakari, okay fine, probably because there is so much of abdominal dragging is causing back pain but the cause of the back pain is actually the spinal stability is not there because of the abdomen not working in synchronicity so there's a defect here this muscle is probably getting activated more not activated less and spinal stability is hampered so how can we achieve this tension free defect closure well 
the tension free defect closure so, uh, one of the surgeries that you will probably say is i pump plus you can close the defect by i pump plus you can close the defect and then put in the intraperitoneal only mesh that will hold good other way is what we did rive stopa if you do a retromuscular repair you go there you take out all the hernia defects along with the bad skin do the retroductus approach and that should medialize 5 cm per side so you can close about 10 cm of defect with rive stopa and bring it together then you could do component separation these are myofascial releases which you could do on the anterior uh, anteriorly or you could do it posteriorly so component separation could be all three so you you have you can close the defects by i pump plus rive stopa and component separation so all three methods are possible so when we talk about uh, rest uh, reconstruction the first thing i want somebody to take everybody to take home the message is that we want to close the defect that's number 1 in a tension free manner with the autologous tissue reinforced by a mesh and the second thing is we want to put in the mesh in the best possible plane now that is an onlay this is an inlay almost not done ever now because high recurrence rate and this is a underlay but if you were in the plane between the rectus and the posterior rectus sheath that would be a sublay so let's remember these names because this will keep on have coming so frequently onlay inlay sublay is not mentioned here and underlay underlay is both ipom and preperitoneal so if you're doing a preperitoneal repair it's still underlay if you're doing an ipom it is still underlay inlay but if you're doing like which one inlay is, like a bridge. inlay is just a bridge. bridge in fact onlay inlay underlay sublay you can still do as a bridge all, all of them as a bridge, bridge. but sublay ko bridge karna is difficult hai. because as soon as you've done sublay the midline is coming together right because that's a release so when you dissect this muscle from this posterior rectus sheath this would migrate 5 centimeters to the midline so that is why the sublay is one of those techniques where there is medialization it's a release so what do we know from this diagram we know that if you want to put in a mesh subcutaneously and underlay well, possible but the intra-abdominal pressure will try always to throw them out whereas the sublay the intra-abdominal pressure will always try to keep them in and it is getting impregnated and incorporated by both sides the mesh and the tissue is impregnated on both sides so therefore there are literature to suggest there is more type 1 by type 3 collagen in this kind of mesh placement so that is what mean uh, what is meant by abdominal wall reconstruction so now we come to whom do we whom do we give awr right whom should we give why or whom should we offer such an extensive surgery you could do only eye pump much more easily than defect closure we can retrorectus so there has to be a solid indication what would be that solid indication so you all tell me now we have said something in the morning but where would you think after what i have said now and based on your experience where would you use a surgery such as this recurrence i think recurrence would make a great case for doing awr if the patient has failed a surgery good surgery once maybe twice maybe more times than this then it would be best to give the patient the best possible repair which would be an abdominal wall reconstruction because you're using the concept of gprvs you're putting into the retro rectus you're having more more mesh impregnation and you're using the best mesh possible polypropylene so that would make a good case what else very big, very big defects very big, very big defects where would we would need tension free releases so we could do tension free releases going retro rectus and tar or we could do anterior component separation so these are two indications any more indications it's better that you come up because then it will remain patient, there patient factors. patient factors like see diabetes diabetes obesity and smoking these yes. are the three main things but smoker ka you cannot change your operation for the smoker you have to just make them non smokers diabetes and obesity in obesity yes if 
if you see the West people, they don't consider BMI of 45 a big issue. Here in India, probably we have been saying BMI 40 and above, oh, we'll not do. We'll first you do bariatric, then you come back, we'll do hernia surgery. But in the West, they are now using their hernia procedures till a BMI of 45. Many, many centers are doing that, right? And that is because they believe that if you're, the patient has not come to you for obesity, why should you offer obesity surgery? It's their call. But you could give them a better hernia surgery, which would be an abdominal wall reconstruction. So obesity, obese patients do uh, get an AWR in many centers if they're not undergoing bariatric surgery. So I would urge everybody to see patients of hernia you could do EHS classification. Keep it in front of you. You can do EHS, European hernia classification. But you would, what would you know? In a primary hernia, you would know two midline, two lateral, less than two, two to four, four more than four. That's for primary hernia. For incisional hernia, uh, incisional hernia, you would know M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. That's midline. L1, L2, L3, L4, recurrent or not, and four, four to eight, more than eight. But that is only looking at the hernia factors but would it be reasonable to assume when you see a patient with colonic cancer that you would only look at the stage of the disease the biopsy what it says and plan the surgery would you not look at the albumin of the patient obstructive element of the of the disease would you not look at the uh, uh, polyps proximal to it so or if the patient has a familial adenomatosis polyposis or not would it not be prudent to look at the entire picture? So in a hernia patient, the concept that you should look at hernia factors, patient factors, and wound factors. These factors need to be looked at. And once you take a look at these three factors, we know whether we're looking at a low risk hernia or a high risk hernia. So if you see these three factors are bad in that patient, you say, this is the bad patient, I would like to go for more radical surgery. So it will make sense. So giant defects, recurrence, atypical sighted hernias, or bola. we have to talk on atypical sighted hernias. In an atypical sighted hernias, suprapubic, rhyphoid, plank, it would be an easy task to go retromuscular, put in a large mesh, without the fear of ki yaan pe tack karenge to ribs mein lagega. If I tack it posteriorly, it will hit the vessels or it will hit the nerve because you are putting in a large, heavy polypropylene mesh in an area where you know that there is not going to be any vital organs and the, you don't have to fix it. So that's another area where you would like to do abdominal wall reconstruction and we'll show cases tomorrow. And lastly, contaminated cases. Contaminated cases. We've all seen intracutaneous fistulas because of previous mesh, right? Or we have been operating and we have an accidental enterotomy. Or we are repairing a parastomal hernia. All are contaminated cases. We just need to remember indications of abdominal wall reconstruction. What is abdominal wall reconstruction? I've given you a brief outline. And where it is indicated? Just think of hernia factors, patient factors and wound factors. Apply it in your own setting. And then you will get the answer. Where I will use it? Of course, as I said in the morning, many times you will overuse it. And that is fair. Because when you start something new, you will have to start with simpler cases. We have all, all done it. When we choose common bile duct exploration, we have to do 2cm CBD, it's better. You don't even touch 1cm and below, right? So that is an important thing to remember that we have to use this technique for indicated cases. But initially, you probably use it for some of the simpler cases. So use it for giant hernias, recurrences, atypical sided hernias, contaminated cases. As I was talking about contaminated cases, when you look at contaminated cases like parastomal hernias, accidental enterotomies, and uh, uh, any spillage in that plane, you could still get away doing a retrorectus mesh placement with an intra-abdominal surgery. But you will probably not get, a, get away by doing an uh, by doing an intraperitoneal only mesh so with that i will i will say think of reconstruction think less of bridging repair and this is why we will be having more of these awr training courses so that we could communicate regarding these newer concepts it doesn't necessarily need to be in the right direction but it does 
provoke a lot of thought and probably by having these courses we would progress in some direction for these complex hernias that we have been talking about. Okay. Thank you.